Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Chemical to test chlorine levels in St. Catherine still unavailable. JFJ hits back at Justice Minister over criminal protection comment. And later in sports, Jamaica's women eyeing 4x100 meter medal. I'm Anthony Log. Here are the details. Up first this afternoon, the St. Catherine Public Health Department has reported that the chemical used to test the levels of chlorine in water will finally be in the parish soon. It comes weeks after concerns were raised that the water quality in St. Catherine could be compromised. Kalisha, Kalisha Williams has that story. A stunning revelation at a meeting of the St. Catherine Health and Sanitation Committee in June. The DPD reagent, which is a chemical that is used to test the levels of chlorine in water, has not been had for months. This is scandalous. Fast forward to July 21, Deputy Chief Public Health Inspector for the parish, Dennis Douglas, told the committee that the department will soon be able to resume testing the chlorine levels in piped water in the parish. She also explained why the testing agent was not available. Right, so we were experiencing um, challenges with procurement and supply, more so supply issues, and uh, the reagent um, is available and we have received the purchase order we are getting supplies today the chemical is used to tell whether there is too much or too little chlorine in water to ensure it is fit for consumption which is why there were concerns that the water quality in the parish could have been compromised for months one councillor had indicated that residents in his community have had health complications since the absence of the chemical. However, there has not been any confirmation that it could be linked to the chlorine levels in the water. Now, chairman of the committee, Sidney Rose, said he's hoping that the parish will not run out of the chemical in the future. So, in fact, there was none available over a period of time. And I'm most delighted to hear and to understand that the residents of St. Catherine can breathe a fire of relief, that their water quality can be now tested on a random basis as they ought to by the public health department. Kelisha Williams, TVJ News. Jamaicans for Justice, JFJ, has hit back at statements by Justice Minister Delroy Chuck that suggest human rights advocacy groups protect criminals. Speaking today on the morning agenda on Power 106, the leadership of JFJ sought to set the record straight. Head of Jamaicans for Justice, Mikhail Jackson, says advocacy groups should not be criticized for holding the state accountable to respect the rights of all citizens. It comes as Justice Minister Delroy Chuck yesterday stated that human rights advocacy groups have been primarily focused on the injustices done to offenders by the state. He said this approach had emboldened criminals to breach the law as they will get protection from advocacy groups. We do not protect any criminals. We condemn criminality. We ensure that the innocent citizens are always protected. But we have to go back to holding the state accountable. And Ms. Jackson has dismissed the assertion that human rights advocacy groups are a hindrance to due process for victims of crime. She argued that families are facing a lengthy wait for justice as matters are being put off in the courts sometimes for years. Ms. Jackson highlighted the case of 23-year-old Matthew Lee, who was killed by the security forces in 2013. A few days ago, one of the attorneys supporting the matter went before the court. And did you know, Sanjay, that the matter was delayed again by two more years? The matter will not be brought before the courts until 2024. This is a young man who was killed at the hands of the state. So when we talk about due process, this is what we're saying, that near, there needs to be an overall of the justice system. In the meantime, Ms. Jackson says Jamaicans for Justice, through its Justice for All campaign, which was launched yesterday, will focus on educating the public about their rights and the obligations of the government to protect human rights. She hopes thereafter... Jamaicans will join the JFJ in holding the government accountable. Renewed concern this afternoon about the number of deaths on the nation's roads since the start of the year. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck says the new Road Traffic Act will fix some of the challenges on the roads. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck on Thursday afternoon 
issued a strong warning to road users to reduce their speed. It comes following an increase in road crashes since the start of the year. According to data from the National Road Safety Council, NRSC, from January 1 this year up to July 22, 263 people lost their lives on the nation's roads. Our roads have now become the next killing field, apart from the gunmen and the criminals. The vehicles are n that people are driving as if they're M16, they're causing chaos and carnage on the roads. It's why he says the motoring public must be their brother's and sister's keeper. And urge others who used to drive in too fast, slow down now. You see others breaking traffic like, tell them to stop now. These are simple courtesies which should be extended so that some decency, some lawfulness can be returned to the courts. He says that this is important as the courts on a daily basis are filled up with majority of road traffic cases. But he says with the new Road Traffic Act now being looked at by the upper house, motorists should be wary as the measures will be tougher and will not be easy to circumvent. And when it is put into operation, all of those persons who are ticketed will find that even if they don't come to court, when they go to renew their driver's license or their motor vehicle license, they can't be renewed because the penalties must be paid. Mr. Chuck was speaking in St. Thomas, where 41 individuals were commissioned as Justices of the Peace. O'Shea Masters, TVJ News. A partnership between the government of Jamaica and a U.S.-based university is expected to significantly cut high import costs for goat meat and help to expand the industry. The plans were discussed at a recently held stakeholders meeting in St. Andrew. Krista Campbell has the details. Over $1 billion spent to import goat meat into Jamaica every year when there is potential to grow more of the animals to supply local demands. And so the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA, has turned to American Agriculture University, Langston, for help. Nutrition accounts for the majority of expenses in a goat operation. And so if we can minimize expenses due to feed and feed costs, uh, then we can maximize profitability. To do that, the university has developed what's called a forage geodatabase across Jamaica. We have the, the wet area, the very wet, the intermediate and the dry. And so it is about identifying forages in these different areas, testing the soil, testing the forages, and to, to do a map of it. So when you, at the end of it, you should be able to see across the island, these are where you'll find like your mul a lot of the mulberry growing. This is where you may find a lot of moringa growing. This is where you find a lot of king grass growing. This is the soil type that it grows best in. Farmers are also being trained on how best to mix the food they give their goats so they get the best nutrients. But there is a challenge getting the nutrient tests done locally. We do not have labs here that do the type of testings that we would want to do on the forages. And so we have to be sending samples overseas, which is another challenge. I know the Boulders Research Station is trying to upgrade their lab to be able to once again do these type of testing. Veterinarian treatment is the second highest expense in goat farming, so Langston University is also training Jamaican farmers on how to reduce internal parasites and other things that make goats sick. And there's more. One of the strategies would be breed improvement. And so we could look then at what we could do in the future and in future projects to be able to use something like um, artificial insemination using fresh semen to be able then to improve then the overall genetics of the goats here, here in Jamaica. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. And it's time now for a break, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to Midday News and thanks for staying with us. Minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Matthew Samuda, wants governments to invest in information to reduce climate risks. Mr. Samuda was addressing a high-level OAS policy forum on tourism resilience in Montego Bay, St. James recently. 
Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Matthew Samuda, says governments must invest in information to create a space accessible to all players in order to build resilience among the small and medium-sized tourism enterprises to withstand disasters and external shocks. Small and medium-sized tourism enterprises represent approximately 80% of the stakeholders in the industry. He explains that de-risking investments such as coastal revetment could allow businesses to invest in coastal areas. While admitting the approach is expensive, Mr. Samuda says it's critical. No, it's very expensive. Each kilometer of coastal revetment is about 10 million US dollars. So for an island of our size and our economic size, you, you can see the challenges that this presents. But the core, I believe, that should be focused on as we discuss efficiency, as we discuss resilience, as we discuss sustainability, has to be that governments have to do what they must to de-risk investments, especially for small investors. Already Jamaica has taken steps to help reduce the challenges facing small tourism enterprises with the implementation of the Jamaica Systemic Risk Assessment Tool, JSRAT. But what it does, it combines all of the data points for infrastructure development, for social risks, and it gives the information to our investors. So persons will know before they deploy capital how to use it. It is not inaccessible to small businesses also. We've been at pains to train several of our small business participants to ensure they have access to this tool. Because we believe information is critical to create the predictability that one needs if they're to invest. Mr. Samuda adds that a bush fire predictor is also accessible to the private sector. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. The Jamaica Council of Churches has joined the appeal by members of the society to repeal Section 53.3 of the Integrity Act to allow the Commission to use its discretionary authority to make statements about its investigations. In a press release, the JCC says such a move would, in its view, that the action will help to sustain the government's commitment to remove the corruption that plagues public operations and validate the sincerity of statements it has made, such as zero tolerance on corruption, and corruption is a dangerous virus. Its wide has called on the Parliament to favorably consider the recommendation of the Integrity Commission. The Council of Churches says the repeal will further address the longing for transparency of the law-abiding members of the public. The JCC says without the repeal of the gag implied by Section 53.3 of the Act, it fears the act will be seen as mere tokenism that will allow the status quo to remain. And changes might be coming to the Association of Local Government Authorities of Jamaica. Some People's National Party councillors have been raising concern over the operations of the association, which is being led by the Jamaica Labour Party. Chairman of the St. Catherine Municipal Corporation, Norman Scott, says the association has become complacent. Hence, he says he be leading a charge if the majority of the corporation across the island are held by the PNP after the next local government elections. I am going to be bringing a resolution to change the format of ALGA so that ALGA is chaired by the minority. It, it is essential, it is important if we are to really achieve the level of governance and support that is required by councillors. And it's time now for the Business Minute with us, with us Shane Masters. Investment Minister Aubin Hill says Jamaica is currently not exploring citizenship by investment as a program in the local economy. In an interview with the Business Minute, Mr. Hill said the government is instead looking at a special visa entry program for investors. For the Jamaican government, not for citizenship. Um, there's discussion about um, an employment visa. When you invest a certain amount of money and you're cleared as being good and clean, you will get an employment visa, which um, uh, the term I'm not sure, the term might not be settled yet, but it's along that line, but not citizenship. That's not uh, uh, um, on the table.
Citizenship by investment programs allow for diplomatic or immigration privileges to citizens of a foreign country when they meet certain investment criteria. Shares of Snapchat parent company Snap tanked on disappointing earnings news on Thursday, dropping more than 25% in after-hours trading. Snap posted a net loss of $422 million last quarter, compared to a $152 million loss for the same period last year. Its revenue grew just 13%, but it had predicted a 20% growth. In a letter to investors Thursday, Snap blamed its woes on a worsened economy and increased advertising competition. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Ashane Masters. And time now for regional and international stories. In regional news, the Inter-American Development Bank IDB Group says it has entered into a collaboration with Israel to empower climate-smart agribusinesses in Latin America and the Caribbean. The IDB Group said Israel is contributing a three million U.S. dollar grant to help create the new Innovation for Climate Smart Agribusinesses initiative, managed by its private sector arm IDB Invest and its Innovation Laboratory IDB Lab. The initiative aims to help agribusinesses in Latin America and the Caribbean respond to climate change challenges while fostering the development of resilient low-carbon business models. On the international scene, the United Nations UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says a deal allowing export of Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea has been signed in the Turkish city of Istanbul this morning. After months of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia mediated by Turkey and the United United Nations. The deal is aimed at resuming grain exports from Ukrainian ports, which have been blocked by the five-month conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Sandy Williams. And we head now to a quick break. When we return, we'll have your midday sports report. Jermaine Brown is standing by. <laughs> 